When I was two years old, a babysitter told my mother, I think there's something wrong with Vanessa's hearing. When I call the other kids for lunch, thank you, thank you. When I call the other kids for lunch, she doesn't come and she just continues playing by herself. This was the first sign of my hearing loss. It also, I believe, was the first sign of my introversion. I picture we introvert me so relieved the other kids have gone so that I could be blessedly alone with the toys. <laughs> I often joke the problem with being a deaf introvert is that when you don't hear what people say, you're kind of okay with it. <laughs> Initially, the doctors told my mother, eh, she's two, she's just being stubborn and not listening. This is what two-year-olds do. Thankfully, my mother pushed back knowing defiance was not a possibility for a compliant child in a corporal punishment household. The doctors said, fine, maybe she has a hearing loss, but she's too young to test. Two-year-olds can't do audiogram testing which requires sitting alone in a soundproof booth with headphones on, indicating when you hear sounds or repeating back spoken words. Thankfully, my mother pushed back again, assuring the doctors, oh, she'll do what I tell her to do, <laughs> and I did. When the audiogram results came back, they looked something like this. So, for reference, this is an audiogram, and what is considered normal hearing for all frequencies is about above the 20 line. You can see that most of my hearing is way down in the 9100 line. The doctors said I had severe to profound hearing loss and recommended send her to a deaf school, teach her to sign, She'll never learn to speak. At that time, for my mother, this option meant I would be institutionalized, marginalized, and felt tantamount to an intellectual death sentence. What she really heard the doctors say was, make her different. And that she would not do. As a daughter of working class Irish Catholic immigrants, with an epigenetic legacy of British colonialism and subjugation, as well as anti-Catholic prejudice in the United States, she learned that being different was dangerous. When your family through the generations has lost the right to language, culture, education, property, voting, and serving in professions such as politics, law, and medicine, as the Irish did for hundreds of years under British occupation. You learn to sublimate difference for safety. So instead, I was given very big, very ugly hearing aids, rudimentary speech therapy, and sent to a mainstream school. I did not learn to sign or even ever meet another deaf or hard of hearing child. I was told, heads down, don't ask for any help, and outwork everyone in the room. My family held my hearing loss as, don't you be thinking your life is hard because your ears don't work. You just be thankful the good Lord didn't see fit to take your eyes too. <laughs> so this is the beginning of my disability journey I'll be sharing today, but before I continue, and we explore the intersection of disability and creativity, I'd like to pause. First, you are very welcome, as is our welcoming greeting in Ireland. As taught by my gran, I would want to offer you something to drink, a bit to eat, but thankfully, Tina has already done that. <laughs> Thank you for gifting your time and presence, both in person on the live stream, and those who watch or share this recording later. Attending Creative Mornings is often described as feeling like you've received a gift. Gifting your attendance and attention 
contribute to the alchemy of all that makes Creative Mornings what it is. And just by being here, you are a disability ally. Congratulations. <laughs> Second, I want to expand the scope a bit. Yes, we'll be exploring disability and creativity, but the disability I mean to speak of is not limited to medical or legal disability. In sharing my disability journey, how I've gone from hide to pride, I've learned even if you don't have or haven't been taught by disability, nearly everyone has something that feels not allowed or not enough. Something within them that their family, their friends, their trusted or feared authority figures, community, society at large, or most painfully, that they themselves have said, not allowed, not enough. After every talk I give or panel that I'm on, while yes, some people reach out to me for resources or recommendations, the majority of people who connect with me do so because they simply want to share the thing that they've hidden. And while everyone's not enough, not allowed is different, and everyone's holding and healing of it is different, it's also at the same time identical, if not in specifics, in felt sense. We all know the weight of want. So before we continue, I'd invite you to reflect for a moment with compassionate curiosity on what that might be for you. What is your something? You are not allowed, not enough. And as we continue, perhaps just holding it as close as feels safe for you to do in this moment. For some, that might be right here. For others, we might want to park it across the park, and that's OK, too. So returning back to my story, my hearing loss was just never discussed in my family. I was not taught what it was, how to care for it, what listening fatigue was, and how to care for that, how to even talk about my hearing loss with people, or how to advocate for myself in school and in life, what disability accommodations were and how to request them, how to navigate social stigma and barriers. I was taught at best to ignore it, and at worst, to hide it. I learned that being down at that line where my hearing was was not allowed, not enough. And then I should be up at that line in the range of, quote, normal hearing. And it wasn't just for my family that I received this message. It was everywhere, intentionally and unintentionally. I didn't see myself in the world at all, not in school, not on TV, not in the movies not even in books, save for the one biography of Helen Keller. Ramona Quimby and Nancy Drew did not wear hearing aids, and I wanted more than anything else to be Ramona Quimby and Nancy Drew. In addition to not seeing myself in the world, I felt barred from even entering it and participating in the world because most of it was inaccessible to me. There were no assisted listening devices, no captions, hardly even any volume controls. So things like ballet classes, student orchestras, Girl Scouts, sports, movies, or even just whispering among friends as little girls are wont to do, were all either off limits or just really, really hard for me. But I had to make it work. And without any guidance as to how to live at that top line, from my family, my teachers, my doctors, and with the added pressure that I was expected to be the first professional in our family's history, a family of miners and military and manual laborers, 
I had to become what I see now is quite creative. I had to teach myself to hear by other means, by lip reading, by nonverbal communication, such as facial expressions and body language, by sensing the energetics of feeling tone in the room, and using other visual cues. I learned to hear with my eyes. I also compensated in other ways. I sat up front in class so I could lip read, and I learned to be a voracious reader and memorize large volumes of information in advance of class because I couldn't rely on hearing anything in class. I became hypervigilant in classrooms and conversation to try to anticipate what would be said next or where the conversation was going or what was going to be required of me. So I would not be left out or worse, left not knowing. Unfortunately, growing up in an abusive home with mental illness and addiction made me especially skilled at hypervigilance. But mostly, I just learned to pass, to sublimate my identity, my needs, and disassociate from my body, to try to construct my life to look like as much as possible as someone who lives up on that line, as someone who is, quote, normal. I traveled through my younger years and most of my adulthood with a profound sense of otherness. I felt, not literally, of course, but like a changeling. In Irish folklore and history, children who were sick or had disabilities were believed to be changelings. And changelings were the substitute lesser children that the fairies left behind after taking their real, healthy, and able-bodied children. I was haunted by this sense that somewhere there was an absconded but whole me, an allowed me, an enough me, that lived, loved, and wanted. And as many children who feel this way or had the family circumstances I had, I retreated into books, nature, and animals. These were spaces where I felt whole, and where my hearing loss didn't matter, or better, my hearing loss was a strength. The neurodiversity that is likely a product of my hearing loss only enhanced my experience in these spaces. My synesthesia, the neurological condition where one experiences two sensory sensations simultaneously, most commonly hearing and sight, made words have texture such that reading was a tactile, physical experience for me. Reading and the often needed memorization was made infinitely easier because each word and their corresponding sentences and paragraphs had a distinct tactile sense memory for me. The soporific of Beatrix Potter's stories was soft, like the underside of my bunny's bellies. Tesseract from a wrinkle in time was the feeling of cold aluminum, like the playground equipment in my frigid Minnesota winters. Synesthesia made color have sound, which is why I mostly wear black, because I cannot have my clothes screaming on me all day. <laughs> and it made silence akin to a spoken language with endless permutations of expression, much like my family's native language of Irish, which has a bounty of beautiful words to reflect what English regards as a single object. Silence where my deafness, neurodiversity, and introversion brought me, and where my family and society left me, felt like it was my native tongue and a cherished home versus a purgatory or a punishment. Much later, this love of silence made meditation both as a student and a teacher a natural home. It also greatly aided me as a negotiator because he who can hold the silence 
hold the power. So let's pause again, and I'd like to invite you to touch back in with your particular something. You are not allowed or not enough. And think back, from whom, how, and where you received that message. Were you given a line of where you were and where you should be? And what did you do with that? Did you ignore it or did you internalize it? Was it subconscious? Or did you consciously construct a life around it, as I did? I stopped wearing hearing aids as a teenager, because of a boy, of course, and hid or tried to hide my hearing loss throughout college, law school, an additional master's in law, and while working in a variety of different roles as a lawyer. But I think our psyches experience being hidden as a wounding that triggers a survival instinct, forcing it to do increasingly drastic things to be seen. The enormous toll on my body, mind, and spirit exacted by trying to live at that top line, the line of should, and running away from that bottom line, the line of should not, became untenable. It was like a physical and emotional credit card I charged to daily with a triple-digit APR, a debt I could never pay off or get ahead of. The deeper I pushed myself down, so too deeper was my sense of inadequacy and inauthenticity. To heal, I took a year off to recover and uncover. And I wondered, where was I to live, if not up here or down here? And slowly, it became obvious, the vast space in between those two lines. This is where I needed to live. To learn how to do this, I began literally walking around vast spaces. I hiked hundreds of miles alone with my dogs, finding the forest a space that felt big enough to hold all of me, the hidden, the hurt, the false, and the true, a place where my fractured selves became fused. Spending the season with the multitudes of nature's ecosystems of both and space where seeming opposites not only coexist, but are symbiotic and interdependent, I began seeing myself through that same lens. I realized that everything I had hidden also brought, in addition to pain and shame, tremendous resilience, sensitivity, expertise, grit, beauty, and yes, creativity. How had I missed this? After my year off, I began learning how to live in this middle space. And this learning looked like a lot of different things. It looked like returning to work and self-identifying as having a disability for the first time in my life and receiving disability accommodations. It looked like building a hearing healthcare team to receive technological and therapeutic support for my speech, and my hearing loss, as well as undergoing cochlear implant surgery after it was discovered I had lost additional hearing during the pandemic, because on brand for the pandemic. <laughs> I, it looked like, with the support of wonderful mentors, my employer, and new friends, beginning disability advocacy, leadership, and mentorship, sharing my story, and coming into a community of my people. It also looked like a metric ton of therapy. That too. All of these transformed this middle space into one of abundance and showed me the creativity that resided within. I saw that this was the space 
where I learned to hear with my eyes and developed a million other comp competencies from my disability, like high volume memorization, rapid pattern recognition, nonverbal communication expertise, enhanced intuition, effective interpersonal skills, because pro tip, when you lip read, people feel that you are deeply paying attention to them <laughs> because you are intently looking at them to be able to hear. And problem solving, because living in an accessible world, in an inaccessible world, is a daily problem solving gauntlet. These abilities made me a much stronger lawyer and professional, but it never occurred to me to highlight or champion them. In job interviews, I should have led with my disability as a differentiating strength and said, I may not be able to tell you verbatim everything that was said in a meeting, but I bet I'll be the only one who can tell you everything that wasn't said. Like, who wasn't paying attention or telling the truth? Who didn't agree and who didn't understand? I wish I had realized that how I lived as a deaf and hard of hearing person, having to constantly make quick decisions with incomplete information while anticipating and planning for a variety of outcomes was basically the job description of being a corporate lawyer. <laughs> now, I don't mean to say that this middle space is all hashtag good vibes only. Do I wish there were some things I could hear? Maybe, but not at the cost of the expansive way I hear now. When I can't hear something, what I lament is the lack of accessibility, not my hearing. I love my way of hearing, some acoustic, some electric through my cochlear implant, some through my eyes, some through touch. I acknowledge its reality, but I certainly don't experience it as a loss. And honestly, who's to say what constitutes good, bad, anything when it comes to our bodies and our abilities. Most definitions of what a body should look and perform like are frankly arbitrary and made up, bolstered by discriminating isms, ableism, racism, all the isms. Because most people present a certain way that commonality is the only way, the right way, who defines speech fluency versus stuttering? As if how and how long we take to express ourselves should be narrowly confined to some cadence we didn't consent to. Who says speech has to be spoken? Why can't it be signed? Or that we need to make eye contact when we speak with people or tolerate loud, bright stimuli we permit infinite varieties in nature and the arts. Why not, too, with our abilities? Why not with all of our somethings? All of our not allowed. All of our not enough. So returning back to your something, you're not allowed, not enough, and the strictures it may have put upon you and forced you to live within. What was or would feel like a way into a wider space where you could see the fullness of yourself? What supported or would support you migrating into that wider space? What became or becomes possible for your life there? Does your something transform in this space? Can you see what else it gives you? Could you know it in a different way here? Could you know yourself in a different way here? So why have I asked you to hold your something, 
you're not enough, you're not allowed throughout our time together today. I mean, isn't therapy Wednesday at two, not Fridays at nine? <laughs> I've invited you into that space because I'm seeing with myself so much of where I end in the outer world, I do so internally as well. Whenever I've not offered, knowingly or unknowingly, compassion, kindness, inclusion, or curiosity, or accountability, I can trace it to somewhere internally. I've not offered myself these same qualities. Thus, the work of inclusion, be it disability or any other identity, begins first with an inner allowance, a self-acceptance, and an understanding so that we can expand it out from ourselves to others. When we allow ourselves to live between the lines, in this space of creativity, we can allow and invite others into that space. When we see how our variances enrich our lives, we can welcome and accommodate others' variances as enrichments. In seeing ourselves, we can then see others. And in offering to ourselves, we can then offer to others. While disability can foster a unique creativity in adapting to a world that is largely not designed for variances in body and mind, it is not just disability that does this. All of us navigating our own top and bottom line have some ingenuity we've employed to survive and hopefully thrive. If creativity is the physical manifestation of our unique selves, then embracing our entire selves is how we augment and amplify our creativity. How we refuse to live at one line or the other is a deeply creative act. And choosing to live in a space that is dynamic regenerative and unbounded is not just being creative, it's living creativity. For creativity is never just one thing, one place, one expression, one line. It's the all, it's the whole. And so too with us. We are all the whole, and we are all whole. Thank you so much. <laughs>